This is David Barsamian. Welcome to KGNU. We began uh, the program with a piece of music from the 18th century um, musical virtuoso of Armenia, Sayat Nova, uh, a great troubadour composer, someone who um, made an indelible mark on Armenian cultural history, and that piece is called Kamancha, which is like a, a traditional bowed uh, cello from uh, the Caucasus, from Armenia. I'm very pleased to welcome to uh, KGNU and to the Boulder, Denver area, Peter Balakian. He's the author of the critically acclaimed Black Dog of Faith, winner of the Penn Prize and uh, New York Times Notable Book. He's a published poet, recipient of many awards, including a Guggenheim. Uh, his latest book is The Burning Tigress, a groundbreaking, a groundbreaking history of the Armenian genocide, has been recognized by a New York Times bestseller as the only study of a particular genocide that fully records the motivations of perpetrators, the suffering of victims, and the responses of the outs outside world. Peter Balakian is in Colorado. He'll be speaking this evening at 6.30 at uh, Denver University, uh, Sturm Hall, Lindsay Auditorium, 2000 East Asbury Street uh, in Denver at 630. It's a public event. Uh, for more information, you can go to the website armeniansofcolorado.org, armeniansofcolorado.org, or you can um, call us here at KGNU right after the program, and we can give you directions as well. The number here is 303 Four four nine four eight eight five. Welcome to the program and to KGNU, Peter Belay. Great, great to be here with you. Well, in in a in the, in a in a summary, uh, let me just read something, and then maybe we can we can take off on this. Uh, between 1915 and 1922, the young Turk government of the Ottoman Empire carried out a systematic, premeditated genocide against the Armenian people, a Christian minority living under Turkish rule. Over a million Armenians were exterminated during this time through direct killing, starvation, torture, and deportation, and about another million were sent into exile, thus wiping out a 3,000-year-old civilization living on its ancient homeland. Despite these indisputable, indisputable and uncontroversial uh, historical facts, I mean, the amount of do documentation is just staggering that uh, verifies this historical uh, genocide, the Turkish government has continued uh, to deny the genocide of the Armenians. And that, of course, is a part of the topic of your latest book, The Burning Tigress. I mean, you know, a genocide is not like a traffic accident where, you know, two people say, well, you know, he, you know, he didn't put on his blinker and he was turning left and the other person said, no, he's turning right. I mean, we're talking about mass murder on a huge scale. How do you deny a genocide? Well, you know, I think it's uh, somehow congruent with the fact that the perpetrators at the time were denying what they were doing. And if you study, uh, you know, crime, you find that the first response of a perpetrator is denial, whether it be murder of an individual or, or genocide of a, of a whole race of people. I think it's probably safe to say that if the uh, Nazis had won World War II, we would know very little about the extermination of the Jews of Europe because perpetrators want to conceal and deny. What's so astonishing and appalling, of course, about the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide is that the Turkish government has continued to cover up this crime against humanity, try to absolve itself of responsibility, has, has blamed the victims, has created a counterfeit reality, and that this has been generated by a state, you know, and a, and a client state of the United States. Uh, and, of course, what happens in denial is that a, a, the perpetrator culture begins to socialize its people into believing a counterfeit version of history. And so if you continue, and this is nothing, nothing less than brainwashing, 
in a way that we've seen brainwashing happen in China. We've seen it happen in Stalin's Russia. We saw it happen in Nazi Germany. The Turkish government does the same thing. So they've brainwashed uh, uh, their people uh, in a desperate act to try to cover this history up. And uh, that's tragic, of course. And, of course, they have tried to uh, blackmail and coerce foreign governments like the United States, for example, most dramatically, into caving into their denial, that is, into colluding with, with, the, with the Turkish government's denial. I think one of the most astonishing facts of this recent history of denialism in Turkey is that in September the Turkish government uh, uh, re revised its penal code 306 to make acknowledging the Armenian genocide in Turkey a crime punishable by up to 10 years. This strikes me as no way to uh, reach forward to the European Union and pretend that you're a democracy. The great Czech novelist uh, Milan Kundera has written, the struggle of humankind against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And then he writes, this is in the 1970s, the bloody massacre in Bangladesh quickly covered over the memory of the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. The assassination of Allende drowned out the groans of Bangladesh. The war in the Sinai made people forget Allende. The Cambodian massacre made people forget Sinai. And so on and so forth until ultimately everything lets everything be forgotten. So talk about memory. Well, I think that um, yeah, uh, Kundera's statement is a is a powerful warning ab about. Uh, I, I I'm not as pessimistic as he is, and I I I mean, there's almost something despairing, you know, about that statement. But it's a powerful moral reminder that memory is in fact a moral issue. Memory is a moral reality. Uh, uh, many people know that Adolf Hitler said eight days before invading Poland in 1939, who today, after all, speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians. Now, Hitler was inspired by the fact that less than two decades after what had been the greatest international human rights crime and catastrophe <coughs> of the era, there had been virtual amnesia. And the fact that there, the Armenian genocide had been in some way washed down the amnesia hole by the late 30s emboldened Hitler. It, it gave him inspiration uh, uh, to proceed with his own ghastly uh, vision of race extermination that would entail the Jews, the gypsies, and others. I mean, Hit Hitler's mass killings were, were hard to imagine. And I also think that uh, Hitler was, of course, inspired by the fact that the young Turks had gotten away with this with impunity. So it reminds us that, that justice matters, that, in fact, bringing perpetrators to justice is a major act of memory in and of itself. And we, we might also be reminded that the Eichmann trial in 1961 had a huge impact on Holocaust memory. It was a watershed for Holocaust memory. So justice matters in this. And very similar to the kind of terminology that the Nazis used, the leadership of the Turks at that time, uh, Enver Pasha, Talat Pasha, and Jamal, it was a triumphant, uh, a, tr uh, a troika that ruled the country. Uh, they called the Armenians a cancer, a bacteria. Uh, a right. people were reduced to a medical term. Right, right. Um, uh, you know, we see this parallel again with the Holocaust of, of scientizing and medicalizing, uh, a, a targeting a, a, a hated minority culture. Uh, and and uh, spreading this ideology throughout the country so that ideology becomes an important part of how perpetrators mobilize their own culture to engage in wholesale massacre. You, you need ideology, and what you're referring to is this medicalized ideology of a hated minority group as a necessary uh, evil to has to be wiped out is really part of this larger xenophobic nationalist ideology. Pan-Turkism is what it was called uh, in the Young Turk government's period of 1915, and the Nazis had their, you know, their Aryan race, super race ideology. These two moments in history have real parallels. So it's, it's critical then to posit a Herrenvolk 
a kind of Ubermenschen, a master race, versus the Untermenschen, a, some kind of an inferior race. Well, this happens. In, I think in most, ide- uh, in most genocidal histories, you will find that there is race ideology that is demonizing a smaller, less powerful group and romanticizing a, 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 the, the, the ruling group or the group that wants to have ultimate power. Sure, I think, and I think issues of power are really important in understanding how genocide is able to proceed and evolve. Just to fast forward to 2004 and to today, uh, American generals in Iraq are referring to Fallujah as a cancer that must be eliminated. It's the, it's the same kind of uh, medical uh, terminology to describe uh, uh, you know, this particular right, problem. Right, right. It's horrifying. Uh, Stephen Kinzer is a fairly respected journalist, uh, and it's interesting. He's written a couple of books about uh, American history, the overthrow of the uh, Guatemalan d- d- democracy in 1954, uh, and then a book, more recent book, on the overthrow of the Shah, in a, the overthrow of uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in 1953 in a, de- a democratically elected government in Iran. And uh, he wrote an article in the New York Times, for which he continues to write, that Armenia never forgets. Maybe it should. And the gist of the article is that, well, you know, these people have been fixated on this one event in in the period of 1915 to 22, maybe it's time to, quote, get over it. Well, you know, it's sort of surprising to hear from a, a person who, who is a Jewish American and uh, I think has some, some uh, deep passions about the Holocaust. Uh, Mr. Kinzer is a long story. Um, I could speak for a long time about my own encounters with him. Sadly, uh, he he is uh, he has written some some um, solid scholarly work on the Middle East, but his long tenure in Turkey clearly has made him uh, biased, uh, and he seems to have absorbed the Turkish government's a piece of the Turkish government's propaganda mill, and he's somebody who has not been able to write honestly, in my opinion about the extermination of the Armenian people in 1915. He is a, he's a kind of capitulator to Turkish denial. His reporting for the New York Times uh, really was not good. And um, I'm not sure he hasn't reported anything in a while, so maybe that means something. The Armenian presence in its traditional homeland in, in eastern Anatolia and in the Caucasus uh, predates the arrival of the Turks by at least two millennia, by at least... 2000 years. And you know, I read the New York Times uh, every day and other magazines and you know, they would they would write they write stories, you know, in the travel section. It's very revealing that you uh, you know, read about these, you know, wonderful uh, monuments and places to visit in present day Turkey and they never mention the past. The only thing that uh, is, only acknowledgement is that well, these might have been these were Byzantine uh, or early Christian monuments. Well, it's it's part of the. I was talking earlier about the brainwashing of a culture, the socializing of a culture, uh, in to denying very horrific episodes in its own history. Now, Turkey clearly seems to me to be a place that disallows critical inquiry into its own past, and part of that disallowing critical inquiry has resulted in obliterating the truth about the rich minority cultures that have made up Anatolia and the, the land on which the uh, Turkish people live today. So so the, the tragedy here, the double tragedy and the denial uh, part of this is that uh, Turks have denied themselves access to their own history by expunging the presence of Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, and others from the record, from their official popular cultural record. Uh, This is going to be hard for me to do, so bear with me. But uh, we're going to hear an excerpt uh, from my mother, who was a survivor, uh, speaking at a history class uh, at the University of Colorado in Denver in 1986. They took all the men in the field, they tied their hands, and they shot it, killed it, every one of them. I remember they collected... The only 15 years old boys 
left, just like this. They were sitting, and their hands are tied back, and they took in the field. They shoot them, too. Nothing left, only women and small children. We were in some Kalitsin. In Aksorin. We deported in some city, bare food, nothing to eat. They took everything from us. They say, we put in a church. When you come back, we'll give you back, which is not true. So we went to uh, some city. My aunt gave a birth. We, they left, she left her baby over there, and then we walk, walk, walk. So many, no water. I remember you, they, my mother used to, they, her handkerchief and, a, excuse me, horse uh, urine and wipe our ma- mouth. We were so dry. Just think that. Just think that. Um, that's my mother, Araksi Barsamian, speaking in Denver in 1986. Um, most of her uh, family was... Uh, wiped out. She managed on this deportation march uh, to get to Aleppo in uh, northern Syria. And um, I know you have a, a poem about uh, Aleppo from from your collection, Peter. It's interesting, uh, David, uh, that our you know our, our, our your mother, my grandmother, traveled this same road to Aleppo, as did many uh, Armenian women. Uh, in 1915. Uh, this is called Road to Aleppo, 1915, and it's in my new new and selected poems, June Tree. It originally came out in a 1983 book called Sad Days of Light. A flame like a leaf eaten in the sun followed you. A white light rose higher than the mountain and singed the corner of your eye when you turn to find the screaming trees dissolving to the plain. Even when the sun dropped, the ground was heat and bayonets, and in the Turkish wind the throats of boys kept ringing in your ears. Your breath-like horizon settled into black. You stuttered every mile to your daughter's shorter steps. The air almost gone filled inside your dress. And Ellis Island was the site of um, arrival for for many, for my father in 1912, and then uh, later when he went back to Beirut and in an arranged marriage uh, met my mother and brought her here in uh, 1921. You have a poem on this island in New York Harbor. This poem is simply called Ellis Island, and it's in the new section of my new and selected. And um, as you're noting, it's it is this uh, essential threshold in American culture. So many have passed through Ellis Island, uh, certainly survivors of the Armenian genocide. Ellis Island. The tides of Bach Cantata. The beach is the swollen neck of Isaac. The tide's a lamentation of white opals. The beach is free, the coke machine rusted out. Here is everything you'll never need. Hemp cords, curry combs, jade and musk, a porcelain cup, a porcelain cup blown into the desert. Stockings that walked to Syria in 1915. On the rocks some ewes and rams graze in the outer dark. The manes of the shoreline undo your hair. A sapphire ring is fingerless. The weed and algae are floating like a bed, and the bloodless gulls whose breath would stink of all of us if we could kiss them on the beaks are gnawing on the dead. Well, you know, listening to my mother, here's an here's an eyewitness. Here's someone that you know, actually was there and saw it. And we have this testimony recorded. Nevertheless, uh, the Turks uh, have been somewhat successful in resisting reality. And as I suggested at the beginning of, of the interview, that this is, not a, this is no mean accomplishment. 
uh, you know, this is this is quite an undertaking. Just think about the amount of time and energy it takes to repress and suppress something like that, as opposed to doing something, you know, really creative and advancing a country and expanding and improving humanity. It's tragic, isn't it? And it really reminds us of, it reminds me certainly of how far Turkey is from being a democratic culture. Uh, and, and yes, I mean, it, 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 to deny the Armenian genocide consumes a good bit of Turkish psychic energy and, you know, state bureaucracy and, and in a country that needs desperately to to be opening itself to democratic culture. For me, the you know, the cornerstone of democratic culture is self-criticism, a society that can't critique itself seriously and deeply. It can't survive in a, in a healthy way. Uh, and so, yes, this is just a, a terrible, it's a horrific situation that Turkey is locked in. And we can only hope that the Turkish government will allow its own intellectuals and people to dig its way out of this. Okay, I'm afraid we're running out of time. My guest has been uh, Peter Belakian. He's the author of The Burning Tigress and uh, June Tree, New and Selected Poems. Peter Balakian, thanks very much for your time. David, great to be here with you. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening.